Today I want to chat a little bit, not simply how we can live a great life, but how do we live a life that leaves a lasting impact? Some people leave their lasting impact with their last words on their deathbed, and I'm going to share with you just a couple of my favorite famous last words. Blues singer Bessie Smith died as she said, I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. That's a good one, isn't it? Nostradamus, who was famous for his predictions, said, tomorrow at sunrise, I shall no longer be here. And he was correct. Marie Antoinette, on the way to the guillotine, stepped on the executioner's toe and said, pardonnez-moi, monsieur. And Groucho Marx, on his deathbed, famous comedian, gave one final joke, this is no way to live. And one thing that is common amongst all people, especially in the later years of life, is not so much how can I grow an influence, how can I be wealthier or healthier, but how can I leave a lasting impact? And sometimes that looks like sorting finances out so grandkids are blessed. Sometimes it means spending more time intentionally with people, passing on wisdom. And for some people, it's just getting their affairs in order. And one of the things so tragic often about untimely deaths is it feels like unfinished business. There are some people, however, who are great at this all throughout their life. Some people leave a lasting impact whenever they leave a room, don't they? You almost feel tangibly a spark of their energy as they leave the room, and it lingers in the air like good perfume. But for some people, they leave a room, and it feels a bit like they've left a bad smell. I think every one of us would like to live a life that blesses others now and in the years to come, even beyond our time here on this little planet. One of the people who wrote most of the New Testament, a guy called Paul, he went about planting the first churches and he, and he comes to a point where he's wanted by the Romans and is now fastly approaching his own death and he knew that it was coming. And he ends up in a place called Corinth and was about to leave it and just before he did, he said to the community there, one of the fastest growing churches of its time, what he reckoned would be the last time he was going to see them, and he gives them his final words to them. And we're going to read them from Acts 20, from verse 22. It says this. And now, as a captive to the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will ever see my face again. Therefore I declare to you this day that I'm not responsible for the blood of any of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. I know that I, after, after I've gone, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Some even from your own group will come distorting the truth in order to entice the disciples to follow them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to warn, you ev warn everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among who all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I worked in my own hands to support myself and my companions. In all this, I've given you an example that by such work we must support the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt down with them all and he prayed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul's last words to the church in Corinth. Live lives devoted to the gospel. Pretty predictable. Even if you've never been in church before, you probably would think that someone would talk about the gospel. It's pretty predictable. But he also ends with a twist. He says, but we should also live lives of radical generosity. Now, this is, a Roman, this is a time in history where the church is being persecuted, where it's illegal to gather, and Paul is saying, keep on chatting about it and keep on blessing people outside of your four walls. It seems counterintuitive in a time of persecution. When I'm going through rough times in my life, it's the time I least want to speak about the goodness of Jesus and the times I least want to be generous. I want to hunker down and be in my own space. But they say this, by this kind of work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In summary, if you know that you are a sinner saved by grace, 
if you know that stuff, that you live according to the gospel truth about you, then that way will show itself through a life that is always looking out for the other. But what is that gospel truth? Well, it sounds a bit like this. Firstly, God loves me. Fundamentally, baseline. Whether you've been in church all your life, whether you're a secret undercover bishop and you're here on a day off, or whether this is the first time you've ever walked in church or in a building with a cross on it, God loves you. Nothing you can do can take that love away and nothing you can do can make him love you more. God loves you, number one. But number two, we mess up. We put things in the way. A bit like Facebook, we make the relationship complicated. We fill it with other things. We prioritize other things. We put things between us and God. We make a life that says, even though I might be aware of your love, God, you're not really welcome in my life. So much so that God had to do something about it. He comes to earth in his son, Jesus, to die for us, to become the embodiment of those barriers, to take them all on his self, to die, to put a stop to them once and for all, to make the path open to God, available to all people in all places. And he sends his spirit to be his presence of love in us, giving us peace and power to go out from these walls and transform society. And so we're left with the decision, do we do something about it or just carry on as normal? Well, Paul reckons that if you've grasped this truth about who God says we are, then the outworking of that is that the world around us is blessed. It is more blessed to give than to receive. But what does that mean? Well, there is healing power in giving, but there's also a hidden power of greed To be blessed isn't just to be good at something, like you're blessed at basketball, or it's not something we simply say when we pity someone, like a poor cat, ah, bless. It's actually, in the Bible, it's a word that brings up an image. Like if I said the word 9-11, immediately you'd have an image come to your mind. And in the same way, Hebrew readers, when they read the word blessed, the image that is conjured up is of Adam walking around in the Garden of Eden with God. No barriers, they were chatting, breathing the same air, talking in the same space, sharing life, walking and talking together. The word blessed all throughout the Bible then tells us that whatever is being described as blessed is almost like a snapshot of that state. Almost like a, um, uh, an experience of that fullness and flourishing just, just for a moment, like a taste of it. And so as we give, if it's more blessed to give, we're finding a healing power of giving because we're taking part in the healing of the world, that, that destination that we're all going towards, which looks like total blessedness. However, on the flip side, there's a hidden power of greed. Why does Paul speak about greed above all other things as his final words, this community? Well, I think it's because of this. What some people call the seven deadly sins, pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth, most of them are obvious, either to you or to other people. You know, if you're spending all day on a Saturday in bed till 7 p.m. watching Hollyoaks reruns, there's something slothful about that action. If... You're going for your seventh helping at a Chinese all-you-can-eat buffet. There's something a little bit greedy about that, something a bit gluttonous about that, sorry. But the problem with greed is no one thinks that they're greedy. No one thinks they have a problem with it. It's so hidden. And often the things that we least speak about hold the most power. And in this country, if you're from the UK, it's deemed impolite or unclassy to speak about money. And that's because it has a hidden power in our lives and a force. It tears people apart. Unpaid debts rip families apart. My family is one of them that bust-ups have happened over very, very small amounts of money. But yet the Bible talks about money and wealth over 800 times. And the reason for it is this. This book, this book is a book that has something to say about us being under any kind of bondage. It is a book that is God telling his people how to be truly free. Free from powers and principalities, free from what the world says about you, free from abuse, free from harm, free from a worldview that says you have nothing to offer. It offers complete liberty in its pages. And so one of the most powerful forces in the known world, money, it's going to address it. But don't get me wrong. Money is not an evil. It's not even an idol. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. 
Money isn't an idol, but it's the pathway to find out where your idols are. And let me explain this just for a second. I love being generous. I really, really get kicks out of it. But I sometimes do find it hard, especially when the cash flow dries up. And if you're a vicar in the Church of England, um, you're never, ever, 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 ever going to experience a pay rise, only on inflation. But you never, ever, so this is it. This is how much I'm going to earn until I die or whatever, or retire. Um, never, ever, ever, uh, no bishop will offer me a, a sports car or anything or a watch. I'll just be on the same money all the time. Which means that you can plan for things, but it also means that there are times in the year where cash flow just dries up around Christmas and the summer holidays. And at those times, I just want to hold on. I just want to hold on to our money and say, well, this is the time where we go on a little family holiday. This is where we get a slightly bigger turkey than last year, so we can do I want to hold on to the money. However, in those seasons, I never find it hard to buy board games or books. Never. Never, ever, ever. I'll buy six commentaries in that time. I'll buy a few board games. Why is that? Well, it's because secretly, if I'm really honest, I get loads of identity from being someone who reads lots. I get loads of identity through someone who sometimes says clever things. And my brother says I'm like a um, less intelligent Russell Brand. And I find that a real amazing compliment. The thing is, sometimes when I'm in meetings, I present as this kind of scruffy cockney. And occasionally, I surprise people with something slightly wise. And I get loads of kick out of that surprise. I love it when I put up on Instagram a picture of my new read next to a flat white and it gets at least 10 likes. I find that an amazing, like, uh, adrenaline shot. I love to have my identity wrapped up in my teaching and my studying. And I also love to be known secretly as an absolute nerd. Because I think the thing that I got bullied for at school becomes cool the older you get. I love it. But St. Paul said this, that if I find my identity in the thing God says over me, his story of grace, then generosity is what flows from that. And the problem is churches throughout the ages have got this wrong. They sometimes, when they've talked about money and wealth and that kind of thing, they've appealed to the will. They've said, you better give or God will get you. If you don't give, then there's a, there's a burning place for you. That may, that may increase a bit of giving for a moment, but the energy runs out. Just stop attending church. Just crack on and then you won't hear that again. Sometimes they appeal, though, to emotion. What we really need to do is we all need to give. And if you don't give, then people go hungry. And if you don't give, then they will fail. And if you don't give, then you just need to give because we need to be the savior of this part of the world. And that may increase giving for a moment. It may, but we can't stay sympathetic for too long. It's why Red Nose Day is just a day and not a week or a month because it would be exhausting. Some churches throughout the ages have tried to appeal to the mind. Here is the best investment. It's basically one conversion for every three pounds raised. And here's our Gantt chart and our RAG rating and seven spheres of growth that we'll see based on your income. But when you're working with flesh and bones, they rarely stick to grids and charts. Where we all need to approach this, you and I, whenever we approach money, is the matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Paul says in Acts that generosity comes from grace. And grace, when you're in Sunday school, is defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. That God gives us everything, his only son. And so our reflection back to him is our generosity because we experience his grace. Because every other rich, I don't mean a Richard, I mean every other rich, other than Jesus will ensnare you. Your career, your house, your bank account, your pop model collection, whatever it is. It won't save us from our mess. And neither will it be there when the proverbial hits the fan, when your relationship is rocky, when a loved one is dying. That stuff isn't going to be there. When we think about Jesus gave everything to be with us, and it's in reflection of that that we find a true place of generosity. The more we see Jesus' identity over us, it frees us up to realize that, we have all, that all we have is his and to be used by him. And we here at this church have had a crazy time of seeing God's generosity poured out over the last year. Where we've been trying to do all we can to bless the community and the wider city. But in case this is your first Sunday, or maybe you've forgotten our somewhat crazy story, I'm going to really recap it really quickly. This building here was built in 1914 on the site of an old tin chapel and became a church known for its community focus and had ebbs and flows throughout its life, having lots of people in its congregation to a very small congregation. 
fast forward to 2017 and the remaining congregation here decided that something needed to change or it was going to be shut down. And so they asked the diocese, which is like the, um, the bosses of all the vicars around here. They asked those guys for help, knowing the potential of this building, but with very limited resources. They needed something to happen in this space. And so with funding from the Church of England, help from a church that I came from in London, and a whole ton of prayer and support of the faithful congregation that was here, my wife and I and 20 of our mates decided that we'd move up to Liverpool to begin this adventure of a church. And here's a little timeline of our time that I like to call the COVID tango. So we're going to have a little look at it. Brilliant. Uh, there's one before that, I think. That's the second one. Here we go. Hey. September 2020, we started meeting online while this building was being refurbished. And then we started Alpha. We did Alpha online. Alpha is an amazing course where you can come, bring your questions, and kind of watch a few videos that talk about all the things about faith, life, and all that in between. So we did that, and then in December 2020, we met in person for about five weeks before, again, in January, we had another lockdown. And so then we met online again, and then we did Alpha again. And during that time, we did loads of online quizzes. We played bingo with my washing machine at home. We did uh, an online murder mystery. We did all kinds of slightly odd stuff. And then in April, we got to meet again in person to celebrate Easter. But we were, we were able to meet, but had to be socially distanced. No corporate singing or mingling. If you were there, do you remember, I had to tell people, you must leave this building immediately after every service. It wasn't necessarily the vibe we're going for, but it was Boris happy. So, and then in July 2021, we sung again as a community. And then in September 2020, welcome new freshers. Hey, freshers. <laughs> and then in October to November, we did all kinds of things. We did gigs, a What I Want to Be party with um, loads of the kids from around the area and loads of other bits and pieces. And in December, we saw more COVID measures in, introduced. And then in December 2021, we had a load of Christmas events. Since we've been open a little over a year, we have seen the first two adults being baptized in this building since records began. Over 50 people have done Alpha, whether you have found faith for the first time or had their faith revived and energized. We saw 800, over 800 people came to the church for a gig or an event or a Good Friday art exhibition or craft market or what want to be party. Our lunchtime service, which is on a Thursday, has grown to about 30 guests. Our Sunday services now see around 200 people come across our two services. And if, every, if one day everyone rocked up who comes to this church regularly, it'd be around 300 men, women, and children, and we don't actually have enough chairs to have everyone in. Through activities outside the church, been involved in helping with Love Your Neighbor, which is a city-wide scheme delivering food and support for those most at need. Through our work at Liverpool College just down the road, we now regularly preach the gospel to over 1,100 students aged 4 to 17. Over 60 parents have attended our play cafe, and 20 leaders have been raised up to lead missional groups around this city, creating a sense of belonging for people in this church. And across our Christmas events, 940 people attended. And we're only just getting started. All of this happened during lockdown in socially distanced and legally sanctified ways. But you may not be stats minded. And it's important though that we count people because people do count. But each one of these numbers is a life, is a story. One of the guys who got baptized had no church experience before, saw a poster outside our church about Alpha, and he had heard about the thing Alpha before and decided to give it a go, and now has a relationship with Jesus and is exploring serving in the life of the church. The other person who got baptized had been a Christian a number of years, but Penny Lane Church is the first time he'd ever felt at home and truly loved by the community around him, thanks to the welcome community and love displayed by you guys. This Christmas, a couple walked in completely on the off chance, walking by because something prompted them to explore faith after a traumatic year. And in this church, they felt loved and welcomed by the community. Someone walked in last November, having landed in Liverpool after fleeing his home in Afghanistan, heightened by his own faith journey. And it just so happened that Sunday, we had a guest speaker talking about the persecuted church. Since then, he's found, out, found love and community that love him, not because of his status, but because he's a human loved by God. A couple of people in our church have been Christians all their life, and yet in the past year, they felt a heightened relationship with Jesus grow as they've experienced the Holy Spirit for the first time in their lives. We have students who have told me over coffee that um, their faith was on their last legs, and it's through being a member of this church that their faith has been rebuilded. God is in the move. He's on the move. In the midst of lockdown, in our online activities, even in our own lives, in, part of, in this part of Liverpool at this time. 
But we have vision to continue to grow in number, in faith, and in impact. Not for our empire, but to see that our communities know the love of God and feel the impact of, this, of his kingdom. We're about to launch an asylum seeking refugee cafe. We want to see our youth work grow. We want to look towards planting a church out of you guys going somewhere else to plant a church. Take what you've learned here and go somewhere else. Not too soon though, please. We want to see us as a church becoming more generous and seeing other churches flourish by our resourcing. And if you want to see that, if we want to be a part of a community that is creative in the way it reaches the world, if it's a hope-filled presence that allows all people to belong, if that's what we want to see, then it comes through prayer, it comes through serving, and it also comes through how we give. Not because it's transactional, the more we give, the more we see, but because it's relational. The more we dethrone the power of money in our lives and say, not to us, but to him be the glory, the more God will change our hearts to see God at work all over Liverpool and beyond. We want to leave a legacy that doesn't simply bless us here and now, but a legacy that means that churches all over Liverpool are blessed, that families are built on strong foundations, that single people know their called and proper place in the kingdom of God, that marriages are made whole, that kids grow up loving Jesus, that society is transformed. And it takes you and it takes me. And so today is an exciting day because across our services, we're being able to say at the beginning of the year, Lord, I have faith. And I want to play my part in seeing God's kingdom come here in Liverpool. And these past few weeks, we've heard a couple of talks about how we can build our lives on a foundation of prayer. Then how we can serve in different ways. And today, we have the greatest opportunity to give financially to the work and life of the church. But before we do, I want to debunk some myths about this church. Most of you know, but just in case, here it goes. The first myth is this, that Penny Lane Church is a wealthy church because we've got a nice car here. Yeah. Penny Lane is totally dependent on its members. We don't hold any reserves yet. We haven't got loads in savings, and all our staff posts are currently funded by an external grant that does run out at some point. The reserves and the savings and the potential lies in your hands, in my hands. So the first thing, Penny Lane Church is not a wealth church. The second thing, Penny Lane Church is funded by HDB, which is the church I came from in London, or the C of E, and that would be wonderful if it were so, truly. But the opposite is actually the case. We pay a voluntary tax, although it's not voluntary because we have to pay it, um, called the, the parish share, which all Church of England churches pay, and it's to support other churches that don't, aren't as resourced as we are. And we're aiming to increase over the coming years how much we give away to both the deanery of South Liverpool and to other projects in and around the city. We want to be a church that's self-sustaining and is generous, and today the money we raise will help us towards that end. And then the third myth is this, that the sums involved are so large that my contribution couldn't make a difference. And nothing could be further from the truth. The giving of any church is like a mosaic made of lots of different pieces to make a beautiful picture. Or like taking out one of the stained glass, just one of the little bits of glass, and then putting it into its proper place so it forms a wider picture. When I first became a Christian, when I was 16, I'd never ever given to anything beforehand. Um, and I heard about this concept called tithing, which a lot of churches talk about, which is where you give 10% of your income um, to the church. And uh, I was a butcher at the time, and I kind of misunderstood and thought what it meant is you spend 10% of your salary in charity shops. And I remember going to church one day and turning to my mate, what do you do with all your stuff? And he looked, gave me a funny look. He was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, I've just got loads of like secondhand DVDs and Xbox games and clothes that I don't really like, but I've just been having to find stuff to buy with my tithe. And he just gave me this funny look. He's like, what are you talking about? For everything we're planning to do across the year, we're estimating that we're looking to see a rise of about £35,000 across the year. And that requires either about 100 people beginning to give about 30 quid a month or about 200 people giving out 15 quid a month which is basically a Big Mac meal or a Happy Meal once a week. There are many people who give by standing order, and if you're not already doing this and you want to give, then I'd love you to consider doing that because it's super easy for us to set our budget against it, and currently 29 people in the church give that way, and it's really helpful. The average of those giving, if you're interested, is about £102.91 a month, but we're dependent on every single offering. 
One person gives about one pound a week via standing order, and someone else gives about 500 pound a month. The Bible says it's not about the amount. In 2 Corinthians verses nine, six to seven, uh, chapter 9, verse 6, 7, it says this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as they have decided in their heart, not reluctantly, nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we are so grateful for being a member of a generous community. It's the most generous and cheerful community here. And we can't wait to see what God is going to do in our church, in our lives, through each one of us as we play our part. And there are two reasons, however, why you shouldn't give to a church. The first is this, if giving would place you in debt. If this whole chat about money has made you feel super nervous and even sat there um, just thinking about the bills at home that are in, in a different color font, trust me, I know where you are. I spent a lot of my upbringing in houses where we had knocks on the door from bailiffs. I know what it feels like. And so if money is an ever-present burden and you're in debt that is hindering you, then I want to recommend this one thing. Get in touch with CAP. And the info is here. And CAP, a charity, Christians Against Poverty, and they do amazing zero guilt and shame-free work that helps people find a better framework and a healthier framework for understanding finances. They are amazing. And the second reason you shouldn't give is if the money isn't yours. Now, I don't mean, I mean, if you've stolen it, don't give it to us. That's laundering. Don't do it. Um, but don't give out your joint bank account if you're married and you're divided on the opinion. I don't want to split up family households because of giving in church. Um, and don't take out a loan on the church's behalf. We're okay. Don't worry about it. So what we're going to do in a moment, we're going to give a few minutes to pray. And then as part of our worship, we're going to write on the envelopes that are on our chairs as pens as well, one of three things. Either you might want to write a gift that you'd like to give by standing order or in the envelope itself, and there's a QR code if you want to scan it on the back that will go onto your phone so you can give online. So you might want to do that. Secondly, you might want to write a pledge, which basically tells us as a church, over the course of the next 12 months, this is what I'd like to give, um, and we'll help you work out how, how best to do that. Um, so just write that on if you fancy, pop your email address, and our team will be in touch. And thirdly, maybe today you don't want to, and that is totally fine. This is not about us saying, please help us fix our leaking roof. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. But thirdly, if you just want to write something on the envelope, what I'd love is write a prayer of faith or something that you found encouraging over the past year so that as, as our team are going through it, we have, a we have a treasurer and an ops director will look at this stuff. Just so you know, I don't know any names of people who give, so it's completely anonymous to me. Um, I only know the amount of people who give and how much is coming in through that way, but I don't know any names, so don't worry about that. But if you want to write just a prayer inside it, something you're asking God for, something you'd love to see more of at Penny Lane, something, you'd, um, something that you're excited about, then please write that in it. And after a few minutes of chilled music, Jack and the band are going to come up and strike up a final song of worship. And at that point, we're going to grab our envelopes and we're going to bring them down into a basket that's going to come up here as an act of worship. Because it's really important to give, not just as a private act, obviously you're not going to be flouting out the amounts, but, as, but it has to be framed in the context of worship. Because it's so easy that we do this functionally. And so it's important that we do that in a frame of worship. So we're going to pray and ask the Lord, what's our giving capacity? How's the Spirit going to grow in our hearts to give to generosity? So as Jack and the team come up, let's pray. You can stay sitting, then, but Jack and the team, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you release us from so many bondages, that you take away so many handcuffs and shackles, and you want us to be free. And Lord, I thank you that we're able to give in a context where we're seeing you at work. We're seeing you at work in exciting times and not everything is just dependent on this one gathering, but we also have a morning gathering that um, we have people there and as a wider church family, we're saying, uh, we're giving you our yes and we want to see more um, of your kingdom come in this part of Liverpool. And so today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us. Would you remind us that gospel truth over our life, that we're saved by grace? And in this time, these few minutes, would you encourage us 
in the way that you, only you can. We pray you would give us um, a figure maybe or a, um, a kind of direction of travel that you want us to, the way you want us to give over this coming year. And Lord, we thank you that we live in such a wealthy um, part of the world where this is an absolute privilege to be able to do. In Jesus' name, amen.